it started as a dare a simple suggestion from Mike, who always loved pushing limits. Manhunt, he said, his grin wicked under the glow of the backyard string lights. It's the perfect night. Jason hesitated, glancing toward the tree line. The woods loomed dark and endless, shadows shifting with the wind. I don't know, man. It's creepy out there tonight, he muttered. That's the point, I said, slapping Jason on the back. What's the worst that could happen? We split into two teams. Mike and I were the hunters, with Jason and Sarah hiding. The yard was massive, dotted with patches of moonlight and shadow. Beyond it, the woods whispered their secrets, branches creaking like old bones. The rules were simple, the hiders had to make it back to home base, the creaky deck by the house, without being caught. No boundaries, no exceptions. Mike and I counted down from sixty, our voices echoing into the night. By the time we finished, the yard was silent, save for the distant chirp of crickets. Flashlight in hand, I scanned the bushes. They're probably by the pool, I whispered. But Mike's focus was elsewhere. He was staring toward the woods, his flashlight beam trembling slightly. Did you see that? he asked. See what? Someone something moved out there. Too big to be Jason. I rolled my eyes. You're imagining things. We crept forward, my flashlight sweeping across the trampoline, the garage, the edge of the woods. The stillness was unnerving. Then, from the shadows, a rustling noise erupted, sharp and deliberate. Mike's flashlight whipped toward the sound. For a split second, I saw it tall, impossibly fast, darting between the trees. Too fast for any of us. That's not Jason, Mike kissed, gripping my arm. His voice quivered. Maybe it's Sarah? I offered, though my heart was pounding. Something about the way it moved in human, deliberate made my stomach churn. Before I could suggest abandoning the game, the backyard lights flickered, then died. We froze, the darkness pressing in around us like a living thing. A sound broke the silence, a low, guttural chuckle, coming from the woods. It didn't sound like any of us. It didn't sound human. Did you hear that? Mike whispered, his voice tight with panic. Of course I heard it, I snapped, trying to mask the growing lump in my throat. But we're not alone out here, right? It's probably Jason or Sarah messing with us. Even as I said it, I didn't believe it. That laugh it wasn't playful. It had a weight to it, something dark and unexplainable, like it came from deep underground. Mike gripped my shoulder, his flashlight darting across the yard. We should call it. Game over. Just then, from deep within the woods, came the sound of running heavy footsteps crashing through the underbrush. Not just one set. Two. Maybe more. Mike and I exchanged a look. Jason, he called out, voice trembling. No response. Sarah? I yelled, louder this time. The footsteps stopped abruptly, as if whoever or whatever it was had been listening. A scream pierced the night, high-pitched and sharp. It came from somewhere in the woods, chilling the air. That's Sarah. Mike shouted, already running toward the tree line. Wait, don't dash, but Mike didn't stop. I didn't want to be left alone, so I followed, the flashlight beam shaking wildly as I sprinted after him. The woods were darker than I'd imagined, the branches clawing at my arms as we ran. Every step felt like a mistake. My breathing was ragged, and Mike's figure bobbed ahead of me, barely visible. Sarah, where are you? he shouted. Another scream, closer now, cut through the trees. This time, it was Jason's voice. I stopped dead, the hairs on the back of my neck standing on end. They're both in trouble, I muttered. But where? The flashlight flickered, then went out completely, plunging us into blackness. Mike? My voice cracked. 
No response. Mike, where are you? Rustling to my left. I whipped around, straining to see anything in the void. Then, just ahead, I saw it, a silhouette, unnaturally tall, barely visible in the dim moonlight. It didn't move like a person it glided, smooth and silent. Mike! I yelled, backing up instinctively. My foot caught on a root, and I stumbled to the ground, flashlight rolling out of my grip. When I scrambled to grab it, I felt something else a hand. Jesus, man, it's me. Mike kissed, his face pale even in the faint light. We need to get out of here. What about Jason and Sarah? I asked, my voice shaking. Mike shook his head. Something's out here. Something dot wrong. Behind him, in the darkness, I caught the faintest glint of eyes watching us reflective, unblinking. My blood turned to ice. Run, I whispered. We bolted back toward the yard, branches whipping at our faces. The footsteps followed fast, deliberate, closing in. Just as we broke through the tree line, the motion light by the garage clicked on. Relief washed over me until I noticed all the lights around the yard were out again, one by one, plunging us back into darkness. Something wasn't just hunting us. It was playing a game of its own. The yard felt different now, wrong in a way I couldn't explain. The air was heavy, almost suffocating, and the darkness seemed alive, pressing in around us. Where the hell are Jason and Sarah? I gasped, trying to catch my breath. Mike was bent over, hands on his knees, looking like he might pass out. I don't know, man, he said, shaking his head. We need to go inside, now. As we turned toward the house, the hairs on my neck prickled. I glanced over my shoulder and froze. Standing at the edge of the woods, partially hidden in shadow, was a figure. It was tall too tall. Its limbs seemed elongated, unnaturally thin, and its head tilted slightly, as if studying us. Mike. I whispered, but he'd already seen it. His hand clamped down on my arm, and he started pulling me toward the house. Go. Go now. The figure didn't move, but it didn't have to. The way it just stood there, unblinking, felt more threatening than any chase. We bolted for the back deck, but as soon as our feet hit the wooden planks, we heard the sound of something behind us. It wasn't footsteps, it was faster, like something cutting through the grass. I didn't dare look back. We threw ourselves against the back door fumbling with the handle. Locked. Why the hell is it locked? Mike shouted, banging on the door. The keys were inside. We hadn't expected to need them for a simple game. Behind us, the sound stopped. I turned, slowly, hard hammering in my chest. The figure was now halfway across the yard, but it wasn't walking. It stood there one second, then it would appear closer like it was skipping through space. Its movements didn't make sense. My flashlight flickered back to life in my hand, and I pointed it toward the thing. That's when I saw its face or rather, the lack of one. The light didn't reveal features. Instead, its face was a blank, reflective surface, like a mirror-catching moonlight. And yet, I felt its gaze pour into me. Inside, now! Mike yelled, smashing the window on the door with a rock. He reached through to unlock it, and we scrambled into the kitchen, slamming the door behind us. We locked every door and window we could think of, then huddled in the living room, lights off. The motion lights outside the house flickered to life, one by one, then went dark again. It was like a countdown. Where's Jason? I whispered, unable to keep the tremor out of my voice. And Sarah? Mike didn't answer. His face was pale, his eyes locked on the window. 
It's still out there. I followed his gaze. The figure stood on the edge of the deck now, closer than before, its blank face pressed against the glass. I bit back a scream as its hand slowly dragged down the pane, leaving a faint smear behind. Suddenly, my phone buzzed in my pocket, the sound startling both of us. I fumbled to answer it, heart racing. It was Sarah. Her voice came through, shaky and faint. Get out of there. It's not just one. What? Sarah, where are you? I demanded, but before she could answer, the call cut out. And then the sound started. Not from outside, but inside the house a low, rhythmic tapping, coming from upstairs. We stared at each other, frozen, as the realization hit us. We weren't alone anymore. The tapping from upstairs was deliberate, almost like a message. It grew louder with each beat, echoing through the walls of the house. Mike clutched my arm so hard it hurt, his eyes wide with terror. We're not going up there, he hissed. But I couldn't move, let alone speak. The sound wasn't coming from a random place it was directly above us, in the spare bedroom. My parents always kept it locked when not in use. A loud crash followed, as if something heavy had fallen. The air around us seemed to ripple with the weight of it, and Mike started shaking his head. This is bad. This is really bad. The figure outside the window was gone. I checked, hoping that somehow it had left, but the absence felt worse. Do you think? Do you think it's Jason or Sarah up there? I asked, my voice a hoarse whisper. They wouldn't be making that noise, Mike snapped his knuckles white as he gripped a heavy lamp, ready to use it as a weapon. It's something else. I stared up at the ceiling, heart hammering. If we stay here, it's only a matter of time before dash. Another crash interrupted me, followed by the sound of something dragging across the floor above. A long, deliberate scrape, like nails or claws. That's when the knocking started. Not from upstairs this time, but from the hallway just beyond the living room. Three slow, deliberate knocks against the wall, each one louder than the last. We turned toward the darkened hallway. It stretched on like a black void, the kind of darkness that felt alive. Then, from somewhere in the shadows, came a whisper. It wasn't clear enough to make out the words, but it was wrong low, wet, and far too close. Run, Mike breathed. I didn't need to be told twice. We bolted for the front door, but as we neared it, the tapping sound moved following us. It seemed to come from everywhere at once, the walls, the ceiling, the floors. I threw open the front door, and we stumbled outside into the cold night air, gasping like we'd surfaced from drowning but as soon as I caught my breath, my heart sank. All the motion lights outside were off, even though we were standing directly under them. What the hell? Mike whispered. That's why I saw them figures in the yard. Not just one, but several, spread out in the darkness. They moved like shadows, flickering in and out of sight, but always closer, always circling. Their blank faces glinted faintly, reflecting the pale light of the moon. We can't stay out here, I muttered, gripping Mike's arm. The car. We'll get to the car. We ran toward the driveway, but as we reached it, every light on the house flickered back to life. The sudden brightness blinded me for a second, and in that moment, I saw them at least five figures, all standing motionless, blocking our path. Their heads tilted in unison, almost curiously, as if studying us. Back inside. Mike yelled, dragging me toward the door. But before we could get there, the front door slammed shut on its own, the lock clicking audibly. The figures were moving now, faster than they had any right to. One was already at the porch, 
its blank face tilting toward me as it reached out. Mike pulled me toward the garage. We'll hide there. Come on. We barely made it inside, slamming the door shut behind us. The old space smelled of oil and dust, and the only light came from a single window, faint and dirty. Do you think they can get in? I asked, panting. Mike didn't answer. He was staring at something on the floor. I followed his gaze and froze. Carved into the concrete in jagged, deep scratches was a single symbol a circle with an X through it. Freshly made. Still dripping with what looked like blood. What the hell is that? I whispered, backing away from this strange symbol. It seemed to pulse, like it was alive, the red liquid still glistening under the dim light of the garage. Mike crouched down, his face pale. It wasn't here before, he said, his voice trembling. Someone or something did this while we were outside. Before I could respond, there was a loud thud against the garage door. The whole thing shuddered violently, as if something massive had thrown itself against it. We froze, staring at the vibrating metal. Another thud. Then a third, this one leaving a dent. They're trying to get in, Mike said, his voice cracking. He grabbed a crowbar from the workbench, holding it like a lifeline. I scanned the garage, my eyes darting toward the window. Outside, the figures were moving again, their motions jerky and unnatural, like marionettes on tangled strings. They were circling the garage now, closing in. Look! Mike whispered sharply, pointing toward the window. One of the figures pressed its face against the glass. Its blank surface reflected the dim light, distorting into a warped, almost smiling shape. My stomach churned. And then it spoke. You can't hide, the voice said. It wasn't human, it was layered, deep and echoing, like multiple voices speaking in unison. The game is still on. Leave us alone. Mike shouted, swinging the crowbar at the air as if it could somehow ward them off. The figure tilted its head, as if amused, then disappeared from the window. For a moment, there was silence, save for the sound of our breathing. But then came the scratching. It started low, a faint scrape against the garage door, but it quickly grew louder, more frenzied, like claws tearing into the metal. I looked down and saw another symbol beginning to form, scratched directly into the concrete floor beneath us. This one was different a series of jagged lines radiating out from a central point, like a crude sun. What do they want? I whispered, my voice barely audible. Mike shook his head. I don't think they're after us. I think they're playing with us. The scratching stopped abruptly. The sudden silence was deafening, and I could feel the weight of it pressing down on my chest. I glanced at the garage door, half expecting it to burst open, but instead, something even worse happened. The lights in the garage flickered, then went out completely. We were plunged into darkness. Mike? I called out, my voice shaking. I'm here, he said, but his voice was faint too faint. I reached out, fumbling in the dark, but I couldn't find him. Mike? I called again, louder this time. Silence. Then, from somewhere in the pitch black, came that sound again, the low, guttural chuckle. It was close. Too close. I turned, straining to see, but the darkness was absolute. My flashlight was still in my pocket, but my hands were trembling so badly I could barely pull it out. When I finally managed to turn it on, the beam cut through the darkness, illuminating. Nothing. The garage was empty. Mike! I shouted, panic rising. But there was no response. The door to the house creaked open, 
the sound reverberating through the garage. My flashlight swung toward it, catching a glimpse of movement. A shadow slipped through the doorway, too fast for me to see clearly. Mike? I whispered, stepping toward the door. And then I saw it, carved into the doorframe, fresh and dripping, was the same symbol as before. The circle with an X. But this time, there were words scrawled beneath it, jagged and uneven, as if carved in desperation. The game never ends. My flashlight flickered again, and as the beam steadied, I realized I wasn't alone. Something was standing in the corner of the garage, its face turned toward me, blank and featureless. The chuckle came again, louder now. And then it whispered, Your turn. The words your turn lingered in the air, chilling and impossibly clear. My breath caught in my throat as I pointed the flashlight toward the corner. The figure was gone. A faint creak came from behind me, followed by the unmistakable sound of slow, deliberate footsteps. They were close too close. My heart hammered as I whipped around, but my flashlight sputtered and died, plunging me into darkness again. Mike! I screamed, my voice echoing through the garage. No answer. Then, from outside, a blood-curdling scream cut through the night. It was Mike. Without thinking, I bolted toward the door leading back outside. The yard was eerily still, bathed in the cold glow of moonlight. I scanned the area, desperately looking for him. Mike! I called out again, panic tightening in my chest. Movement caught my eye. At the edge of the woods, I saw him or at least, I thought I did. He was standing unnaturally still, half hidden in the shadows. Relief surged through me. Mike, we need to go. I shouted, running toward him. As I got closer, dread began to creep in. Something was off. His posture was rigid, his head tilted at an unnatural angle, and his hands hung limply at his sides. He didn't move or respond to my shouts. Mike? I slowed to a stop, just a few feet away. The figure stepped forward into the light, and my stomach dropped. It wasn't Mike. It was taller, its limbs elongated and wrong, like they had been stretched beyond their natural limits. Its face was still blank, but now it had something new, a crude smile, carved into the reflective surface where its mouth should have been. The smile moved, though no lips existed. You're running out of time, it whispered, the words crawling into my mind like a parasite. I stumbled back, tripping over my own feet. The creature lunged forward, impossibly fast, and I turned and ran, adrenaline surging through me. The pounding of my feet against the ground was drowned out by the sound of those same impossibly fast footsteps behind me. I sprinted toward the house, my lungs burning, but the door slammed shut before I could reach it. I yanked on the handle, but it wouldn't budge. Behind me, the footsteps stopped. I turned, breathing hard. The figure stood mere feet away, watching me, its carved smile twisting wider. I screamed and pounded on the door. Help! Somebody help! The porch light flickered on, illuminating the yard and the figures standing in a circle around me. They hadn't been there a moment ago, but now there were at least a dozen of them, their blank faces glinting in the light. The one with the smile tilted its head again, almost curiously. Tag, it said, its voice hollow and echoing. You're it. Before I could react, they all moved at once, surging toward me. I ducked and ran toward the side of the house, narrowly dodging one of them as its long fingers reached for me. My heart felt like it might explode as I scrambled toward the fence at the edge of the yard. I climbed desperately, my hands shaking so badly I could barely grip the wooden boards. Just as I reached the top, one of the figures grabbed my ankle, 
yanking me downward. I kicked wildly, managing to break free, and tumbled over the fence into the neighbor's yard. For a moment, I lay there in the grass, gasping for air. The night was silent again, as if nothing had happened. I dared to look back over the fence. The yard was empty. No figures. No smile. Just stillness. But as I stood and backed away, something caught my eye. Scratched into the wood of the fence, in the same jagged style as before, were the words. You can't quit the game. I didn't sleep that night. I couldn't. I stayed curled up in the neighbor's yard until the first rays of dawn crept over the horizon, bathing the world in an eerie quiet that felt like a mockery of the terror I'd just endured. I waited until I was sure the house was empty of them, then crept back inside to look for Mike and any sign of Jason and Sarah. The house was silent. Too silent. I called out, my voice trembling. Mike? Jason? Sarah? No answer. I checked every room, every closet, every hiding place. The kitchen was still, the living room untouched. But when I opened the door to the spare bedroom upstairs, my heart sank. The walls were covered in symbols. Dozens of them, carved deep into the plaster, circling the room like some kind of unholy language the same circle with the X, the sunburst of jagged lines, and something new a spiraling pattern that seemed to twist endlessly, pulling my eyes toward its center. In the middle of the room was Mike's shoe. Just one. Nothing else. My phone buzzed in my pocket, the sudden vibration making me jump. It was Sarah's number. I answered immediately. Sarah. Where are you? Are you okay? Her voice came through, faint and distorted, like a bad radio signal. You have to run, she whispered. They're not done. It's not over. Where are you? Are Jason and Mike with you? I demanded, clutching the phone like a lifeline. Her response sent a chill down my spine. They're part of it now. Don't go back outside. Don't let them mark you. The call cut off abruptly, and the screen went dark. I tried calling back, but the number wouldn't connect. My chest tightened as I looked back at the symbols on the walls. One of them had changed. The circle with the X now had an extra line through it, splitting it into quarters. The fresh marks dripped with something dark and wet, and I realized with a jolt that the same symbol was scratched into the wood floor beneath me right where I stood. A low hum started to fill the room, growing louder and deeper, like a swarm of bees buzzing in unison. I stumbled back, my head spinning, and fled the house, barely able to keep my balance. The fresh morning air felt suffocating as I stood on the front lawn, trying to catch my breath. That's when I saw it. The symbols were spreading, carved into the bark of the trees lining the yard, scratched into the asphalt of the driveway, painted on the siding of the neighbor's house, stark and red against the white walls. They were everywhere, as if the house itself had become infected. And then I saw the figures again, standing just beyond the tree line, motionless and waiting. Their faces were still blank but their heads all tilted in the same unnatural angle. One of them raised a hand and pointed directly at me. I staggered back, but when I turned to run, I froze. Another figure stood in the middle of the street, blocking my path. This one was taller than the others, its limbs impossibly thin, its face reflecting the morning light in a twisted grin that wasn't there before. It raised its hand, its finger pointing toward the woods, toward the others. The message was clear, I could run, but only in one direction. I turned and sprinted toward the woods, my body moving on pure instinct. 
the trees closed in around me, their shadows swallowing me whole. The figures followed, their footsteps unnaturally loud despite their smooth, gliding movements. The deeper I went, the louder the symbols seemed to hum, their presence etched into the very air. My vision blurred, the spiraling patterns flashing behind my eyes. Then I tripped, falling hard onto a patch of dirt. I turned over, scrambling to get up, but the figures were already there, towering over me. Their faces twisted into reflective grins, each one more warped than the last. You can't quit the game, they said in unison, their voices hollow and infinite. And then everything went black. I woke up in my own bed.